So the constitutionality provided by the National Security Council just is a facade of the real stuff that happens in the high command and in job. You remember that uh, in you know you know it's speculated that um, General General Chiwenga's visit to China in November was actually because he went there to meet the PLA you know generals. So it's more like you know probably to say no guys we are doing this so chill don't worry we 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 have we got this under control. So you can see the power matrix where it, where it comes. In. Now the fourth and final thing before I go to to the uh, to the con to, to my concluding part is that uh, at international level, and this is now we're talking geopolitics now, real stuff, you know. Um, the China has taken a claim on Zimbabwe. You you as we say that uh, you know it, you know in Southern Africa it is only in Zimbabwe. Where China backed, you know, the, the guys who set up, you know, the independent state. So, um, you know, at independence or, you know, after, you know, the, you know, settler colonial rule, you know. And how do we see this? When the Zimbabwean state, you know, read, you know, you know, Zanu Mgawi, you know, somewhere read that, um, was under threat, you know, in 2008, and there was a, 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 a draft resolution that was tabled, you know, at the UN Security Council, which could have we had far-reaching implications. China exercised its veto for the first time, and this was for the first time that uh, China did this for an African country. Um, it's actually the first and only time uh, that uh, they that they exercised this uh, this uh, this veto. For for an, for an African country, and if for you to and I mean for for, for us to understand this uh, this context, you need to contrast it with uh, three years later in 2011, when uh, you know the the China was confronted in the Security Council with a, a, a draft resolution on you know a no fly zone on Libya, and where again in uh, in, uh, in 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 Libya, they you know there were key Chinese companies, state-owned en enterprises operating there, a number of Chinese nationals in there, and actually they got uh, three percent of their fuel supply from Libya, and three percent for China is like big. Uh, it's actually it translates to about ten percent of, you know, uh, in Libyan oil exports. And what did China do? China looked the other way; they abstain. You see, in geopolitics, if you sometimes there's nothing called abstaining. Abstaining means yes or no, depending on a particular context. So you can see that if they if they couldn't protect their nationals and their companies. Through actually, you know, vetoing that uh, you know resolution, um, uh, 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 you know, you know that you know that that caused those kind of challenges for Gaddafi in Libya and the Chinese companies thereof. By the way, but they could do it for lowly Zimbabwe, and that's that's very interesting. And so uh, it 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 shows that China has taken a claim on Zimbabwe and China. Uh, is in Zimbabwe for the long haul. So, for example, uh, if you look at you know China's co diplomatic cooperation models, so China doesn't do uh, you know alliances like the US, you know NATO and others. So, if you look at that, you would find that um, Zimbabwe, you know, is one of the top countries in terms of that are rated in, in the highest levels of uh, diplomatic cooperation with China. It's, it's actually interesting that uh, post Mugabe, uh, in April uh, 2018, two months before the election, uh, Idim Nangaga went on a state visit to China and uh, he was actually rewarded, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese then uh, improved you know the, the level of 
diplomatic cooperation to what is called compre those who study China. It's called comprehensive strategic partnership of cooperation. So this is one of the highest levels in China's partnership democ uh, sorry diplomacy. And for context, only Russia and Pakistan, you know, you know, are higher than that. Uh, you know, of course, Russia has got this, uh, you know, no limits, you know, you know, you know, you know, partnership with uh, China uh, that, uh, you know, they, 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 they know it should just be for the, um, you know, you know, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, and in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe is one of the three countries with this level of cooperation with China, uh, together with Mozambique um, and Namibia. So it's, it's, it's crucial to, to look at that. But also how is China embedding itself for the long term? So recently they've invested in institutional investment in the Zimbabwe Defense Forces, of course, through you know, the, the partnerships with the PLA, but also with ZAN, uh, they've established this party school in Tanzania which uh, trains you know, the, the, the former liberation movement um, in, in Tanzania, it's called the Julius Nyerere you know, School. Uh, so, which, and, and not only that, they don't, are all interested in uh, ZANU. The parliament building that they are constructing in Mount Hamden is the biggest donation thus far. And it is a, a signal that China you know, is hedging its bets. You know? uh, so, and when you throw in the fact that, you know, by building that, uh, uh, by constructing that, that building in a place earmarked for the new capital city. So, which means that uh, it gives China this access to shaping the political habit of Zimbabwe. And that indicates that China is here to stay for the long haul. So now, to conclude, what does all this mean for Zimbabwean politics? Uh, so I have that three uh, things in, as I conclude. The first one is that the growing strength of China in global affairs means its significance in Zimbabwean politics is likely to increase. And you remember that this relationship between ZANU and the and the communist part of China and then the, and then the Chinese state itself um, was you know emerged when China was looking for clients and ZANU was looking for patrons. And so it, it, you can see that China is getting to be a big, a big patron uh, uh, now. And so, which means that, and I said that China is here to stay. Look closely, you can see that China has a failed, has what uh, they, they, they think is a fail proof plan for longevity in Zimbabwean politics. So, how is it so? Plan A. Is through the status quo. So, like, if the status quo continues, uh, it's okay. Uh, they are, you know, they can work with the ZANU, they can work with the military. That's why they have those party schools uh, to, you know, to 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 develop, um, you know, you know, emerging leaders. That's why they, you know, they they help to, you know, the transition from Mugabe, you know, which was told transition to the to the other guys uh, to to inject some new life. So. That's their plan A. But plan B is that uh, uh, they can do so through any of the other political actors or parties. And and why can that happen is because uh, you know the other parties really you know the, the political parties don't matter um, the you know much because in you know internally the Zimbabwe military are the guardians of this strategy, you know. So whoever, whoever would want to get into power, they have to negotiate with the military first, and the Zimbabwe military has this big patron, you know, at international level. Externally, you know, China is cruising towards being a major global force. You should just see what is happening now in the South Pacific, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You know, they are spreading their tentacles in the Latin America. So China is not just looking at Zimbabwe. You know, that's you know, so what some people will say is 
it's a it's a global force. It's giving a headache to America. You know, you know now, Clinton. You know, you know, you know they, they are coming up with strategies in the South Pacific, but China, you know, has just spread these tentacles. You know, you know, all over. Uh, and now it's on the doorstep of of America in the Pacific. And finally, so serious political actors in Zimbabwe have to either confront or find accommodation with the Chinese. I submit that these both of these are useful political strategies by the local actors. So confrontation itself, you know, with China, you know, being anti-China, is a useful uh, mobilizing program in the opposition. If you, if you want to get ahead in the opposition, you can't afford to be pro-China. You have to be against China. If you become pro-China, you know, Zan is already pro-China. So if you you'll get a zero vote, so you won't get it anywhere. But but, but uh, uh, that is a political. You know, you look at the uh, Sata. You know, the uh, rapidly anti. You know, anti-China. You know, um, but uh, confrontation is just useful as a program in the opposition. But that's that it. If if you are lucky, you get into power. Uh, but I mean, you get into office, not into power, really, because accommodation you know, with the goal of finding more room for agents is the winning governance formula. So, you know, whoever is, uh, you know, you know, gets, you know, you know, elected has to work with China. So China um, is the language of governing. Uh, it is, it is the partner of, it is a partner of choice uh, in government for African countries. Uh, you know, uh, being anti-China, it is the legitimate political strategy for the opposition. So knowing those two is a very, a very um, uh, essential. Um, you look at um, the fact that when countries, uh, you know, we have elections in Southern Africa, the first order of business for the president elect is to meet the Chinese ambassador. So uh, that in itself becomes a, an interesting part to see the deep-seated nature of the influence of China in Zimbabwean uh, politics. Nzala, I will uh, I will stop here so that uh, we 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 engage uh, further on my submissions. Uh, th thank you, thank you so much, Doc, uh, for your presentation. Uh, it was excellent. It was eloquent. I think uh, everyone grasped the key issues that you raised there. Um, thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Innocent Batsani Nube, uh, for this great uh, presentation. Uh, I will hand over to my co-host uh, to give us the ground rules uh, going forward. Nonsensa, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nube. You know, uh, I like how you you took your time to actually go back in time uh, to bring the history of, of, of the relationship between uh, the, the political parties, the both political parties in Zimbabwe and uh, in China, as well as the, the military in Zimbabwe and China, um, which in a way then informs how uh, our politics is the way it is today. So we'll open the floor right now for our discussions to throw in their contributions as well as uh, any questions that they may have. So I think I will start with Uti Boza, Dr. Dr. Tobile, then from there we can move to, to Barbara, uh, then we can have uh, Tawona. Unfortunately, Ubu she still hasn't joined us. If she manages to join us, then she can be the last discussant to, to, to contribute. But in that order, please, then we'll then give the floor back to Dr. Nube. Uguti, then he may, you know, respond to whatever questions that may arise from the discussants. Then from there, we'll open the floor to everyone else to share their contributions. But for our discussants, please keep it two minutes and below, not more than that, for sake of time. Thank you. Tipoza, you have the floor. Okay, sorry, before Tiboza comes in, uh, let's retweet uh, and share this space. Uh, if you are not going to 
uh, to request to speak, use our hashtag. It's hashtag China Zimbabwe politics to express your sentiments on whatever would have been raised in this space. Uh, sorry about that. Tiboza, you can go ahead. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mzala Tom, and thanks, Non uh for giving me the floor. Uh, particular thanks to my friend, uh, Dr. Ngube. Um, that was um, a masterclass on 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 uh, giving us a lecture on on how uh, you know China um, is a staked a claim uh, on on Zimbabwe and and how. It actually influences the uh, execution of uh, political power uh, within the Zimbabwean context. Um, it was particularly useful giving us that historical uh, narrative uh, to actually understand where the genesis of uh, this deep seated relationship that um, the Chinese uh, Communist Party and, and the Chinese military in part particular has got with uh, with with Zimbabwe. Now uh, I was doing a bit of research in preparation for 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 your lecture today, um, and some of the things that I found uh, with regards to the growing influence of uh, China, uh, not only as a political player in in Zimbabwe but as a political player internationally, uh, and how China is uh, using its leverage to uh, grow its influence, uh, not only in Africa, but uh, in parts of Asia and, and elsewhere. Um, the interesting statistics that I came across uh, were the sheer amount of uh, investment uh, that uh, China uh, is bringing to, to Africa, um, you know, both in terms of uh, foreign direct investment and also in terms of uh, Chinese loans uh, you know that are flowing into into Africa. So in the past uh, five years, well, in the five years up to late 2020, early 2021, uh, China had invested more than 75 billion uh, US dollars in in Africa, um, and uh, at that point they had about 287 projects uh, going on in Africa, large large scale projects, um, and they were the largest investor. You know, single investor as a nation uh, with uh, you know flow of capital into 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 Africa, um, and also of interest was that you know so when you talk about the money that flows in from China, you have to look at loans and uh, foreign direct investment as separate things. So we've got this issue whereby um, the media tends to cast a lot of light on the loans that uh, China gives to African states because, you know, they, 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 they say that, uh, you know, the debt burden uh, is a way that China is, is, is taking control of uh, the infrastructure and the economies of these countries. But the, we rarely talk about the FDI, which is the actual direct investment into the countries uh, that China uh, picks. Um, so the, the investment uh, that China does uh, is by no means uniform throughout Africa. Um, China has got strategic countries that it does business with. Um, it tries to do business with everyone, but almost most African countries have had a loan from China in one form or another. We've got some project, whether it's a small project or it's a large scale one that is going on at the moment. But to uh, you know, drive home the point that uh, you were making about uh, China uh, having staked a claim on Zimbabwe is to look at um, who are the top 10 re recipients of the foreign direct investment in, in Africa. So you've got South Africa is number one, followed by DRC, uh, and then you've got Zimbabwe coming in there at number seven or eight. And we're talking about Africa with 54, 55 uh, countries. So that goes to, to show you how much of a uh, uh, value that uh, China puts on uh, its, uh, its relationships with, uh, with Zimbabwe. I suppose my question to you would be, when you look at the particular type of uh, investments that uh, come in from, from China, um, they've got this template whereby it's usually around construction projects 
where they uh, established these uh, um, uh, special economic zones that they then operate uh, and is also about uh, you know uh, raw materials in particular marketing so 35 percent of their investments are in construction projects and upwards of 21 percent are in in mining however when you look at um, what would be a visible investment in terms of its impact on the economies uh, in terms of job creation and general well-being it is things like you know manufacturing tourism financial services and all these other things but we do have uh, a, a clear deficit of china investing in these in these areas and by the way when we talk about uh, chinese investment in marketing and their extraction of raw materials when we look at their proportion of investment in those areas which is about 21 percent and compare it with countries like the uk or france or usa who almost half of their investments are you know tailored towards uh, uh, raw material extraction i suppose what i'm trying to ask is how does if we're saying that china is not going to go away uh, you know uh, whether we're talking in the zimbabwean context or internationally how then does that uh, relationship and the particular type of uh, investment that flows in and the kind of investment that we think is going to make a difference for the general population, how is that going to be influenced? And would China actually be willing to work with different political players in terms of uh, mutual uh, beneficiation uh, with their investments and their political uh, program? I hope it, it wasn't uh, too long-winded. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Chipozan, and um, thank you for sharing with us your your research that you did in, in preparation for this. Um, Papra, you may speak now. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Zala and Samantha for inviting me. And thank you so much to Dr. Innocent uh, Bakani Nure. Uh, that was a very powerful presentation and uh, uh, very interesting. Um, I don't have much to, to say, save to say this is so, um, this is scary, <laughs> to, 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 to be honest, this is scary. Aren't we heading to another colonization of Africa, in particular in Zimbabwe? Uh, aren't we heading uh, to another colonization by China? And as a, a people, as a citizens, how best can we, um, uh, maybe unite to fight uh, against it or maybe prevent uh, this colonization. I'm talking uh, from the labor perspective where we are seeing in every sector uh, the Chinese, they are now the major employers and the, the violations uh, that are there, the labor rights, uh, they are not even there. These are in this economic zones, special economic zones, uh, they are everywhere. These people, we know they signed deals uh, to, to do away with the, the particular laws. And I can see, I can foresee a, 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 a more dangerous uh, colonization than the British uh, colonization. And uh, I don't know, uh, Doc, what do you think uh, the people of Zimbabwe should do uh, to stop this? Can we stop this? Uh, if not, uh, what what is the way forward? Because I, I can foresee uh, danger here because these Chinese, they are almost everywhere, in every sector. They are, they are everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Dr. In, uh, Innocent, I hope you, um, you are taking down the yes. concerns. Uh, Barbara is concerned. <laughs> yes, she's concerned about, uh, you know, a foreseeable uh, colonization of some sort uh, coming from China. Okay, Ta uh, Tawana, you may go ahead. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think that was a very uh, brilliant and robust submission by Dr. Nube. Um, I'm just going to try to briefly add on and probably ask you a few questions as I wind up my two-minute submission. Uh, I'd, I'd done, you know, background, you know, research prior to, to coming to uh, this uh, this space, you know, 
um, what I briefly, you know, managed to um, able to um, de uh, deduce from this China factor in Zimbabwe that I find out that it's very uh, complex, complicated, contested, uh, controversial, and very much conflicted. Um, Dr. Mube talked uh, very much about uh, this dominant practice whereby the China factor, when uh, China more or less provided a lifeline to ZANU and ZANLA uh, in, in their you know, uh, anti-colonial liberation war agenda. And it uh, led to this dominant practice of the militarization of the politics and the politicization of the military. And I, I agree you know, 100% with that. And also I would uh, add on as well that we should also downplay the ethnicity factor that it also you know, uh, led to the eth ethnicization of politics and politicization of, of ethnicity, because ethnicity, the politicization and the weaponization of ethnicity became a very important and fundamental uh, factor by the ZANU and ZANLA as a liberation movement and also by the ZANU PF as a, a post-colonial uh, government that uh, uh, ethnicity was weaponized as a form of form, um, what, what we call it, of authoritarian consolidation as a form of uh, established in, you know, uh, 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 sort of a, a hegemonic, you know, um, within our, uh, within our, our, our politics. And, um, you, uh, and also I would add on the aspect of this uh, Maoist ideological political orientation with, with the, with the, uh, by the Zan, ZANU and ZANLA forces. I think we can also, because of this Maoist principle whereby the Mao said, uh, a gorilla is like a fish in the sea, so a gorilla should stay am among the people. I think he, we are, we, I've just come down to January 1980 to March 1980. I think we can see the ruthless streak of that because of what it laid is that this is well documented that, you know, uh, Zanla combatants, you know, during the ceasefire uh, agreement, they, you know, they violated the the, the, the spirit and the letter of the ceasefire agreement, they didn't report back to the assembly police because they were following this Maoist doctrine whereby they stayed in the so-called liberation uh, liberated zones and acting as a de facto you know, political commissars of, of ZANU-PF. And what it laid is that uh, both uh, uh, the great Joshua Nkomo, uh, Abba Muzorewa, they, they did not have the chance to campaign in Manikal and Heartlands and Mashonal and Heartland. This is well documented that Joshua Nkomo lost a number of his supporters yeah, during between 1980 and so January 1980 and, and March 1980, same as Abu Muzerwa, the who uh, uh, were the contest in Manika Land, Heartland, and Mashonal Land. They were declared the no go areas for, 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 for PF Zapu and UNC of Abel Muzorewa. And at one time, it wanted to lead to the, you know, to the banning of, um, of, of, of ZANU to contest what the, the 1980 election. And also, um, I would like to say, say about the issue of, um, uh, um, Dr. Nube talk about the realignment of politics, isn't it? the realigning, no, the realigning of gun with politics. Talking about the 2008 Operation Mafotera Papi and the, the 2017 uh, coup, but I think uh, I don't know if uh, Doc can um, agree or disagree with me. But I think the realignment of gun with politics predates the 2008 Operation Mafotera Papi and the, the 2017 coup. I think the realignment of gun and politics it uh, it happened between 1982 and 1987. During the Gukura Hundi period. And I would agree with uh, uh, what Sifo Malunga says. Sifo Malunga actually said that Gukura Hundi was the first laboratory of Operation Mavotera Papi. I think that's where the real, real alignment of politics uh, started. And uh, so that I may, let me just end so that I can give other people a chance. Uh, and I just want to ask you, uh, Dr. Nube, um, uh, if you could explain to us how did the North Korean factor come in into Zimbabwe? You know, considering the fact that China had played such a significant role in in, in propping up ZANU and ZANLA, why did the Zimbabwean government not choose a Chinese military instructor to train the Fifth Brigade instead went for the for the North Korea? And I also want to ask: this uh, 
China factor where you talk about the militarization of politics and politicization of military, was it one of these um, uh, fissures which led to, you know, you know the conflict between, uh, 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 in, I think it's 1981 or 90, I think it's 1980 or 1980, the end to Mbane because of this ideological difference between Soviet trained Zipras and Chinese trained uh, Zanlas. Was there any sort of that ideological uh, friction which led to that, uh, you know, fratricide of, you know, fallout between two former, you know, guerrillas who became warring parties and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Tawana. Uh, Dr. Innocent, uh, you can go ahead and respond to those uh, three questions and contributions. Then after uh, Dr. Ngube, that's when we'll then open the, the floor to everyone who may have questions. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, before Doc answers, I want to add another aspect um, uh, in relation to opposition. Uh, in your research, Dr. Ngube, uh, would you say opposition in Zimbabwe has made efforts to, 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 to reach out to China uh, from 1980 up to now? Have there been any opposition movement that has acknowledged that China is the key factor in Zim politics and reached out uh, to China. Just from your research, if by any chance you came across that, and would you recommend at this point in time for opposition to reach out to China? Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mzala. Thank you, Nansansa. Um, so um, let me you know, respond quick so that you can then get more, more voices in. Um, let me start with uh, Tibor's um, very interesting uh, submissions and, uh, you know, the political economy of uh, you know, China in Zimbabwe and China in Africa is a big thing. Like I said, when I was uh, uh, delineating or framing, you know, this talk, that uh, that in itself is a big talk, you know, or big talks on its own. So I, I sort of agree with what you, what you have said about that. And, um, um the the oh, your question uh, when you say um you know the in terms of the you know the relationship between china and africa and our in china and zimbabwe can it be influenced to be um sort of user friendly you know for african countries so that uh, the investment uh, goes into the stuff that you're talking about manufacturing um you know rather than you know the kind of you know projects that China seems to be concentrating on. Um, I, and I will tie this with uh, Barbara's uh, uh, question about, um, you know, the the way in which uh, uh, Chinese companies operate, you know, in, in the African context. I didn't want to talk a lot about, you know, that part. But suffice to say, the challenges that we see operationally is that um, China has a strategy for engaging African countries, um, but African strategies, Af African um, countries don't have a strategy for engaging uh, China and they have, you know, maybe explanations to, to, to it because the relationship is asymmetrical. You are talking about a major power that will surpass you know, the US uh, you know, as a major economy and, and, you know, and these uh, uh, small states because in the scheme of things we think our countries like um, uh, you know, uh, you know they actually they punch above their weight because you are look, looking at China with a big market um, uh, um, middle class for about 300 million people and you are looking at Zimbabwe, the whole population, 14, 15 million. If you're generous, you can say 18 million, uh, depending on the census that results. So you can see that uh, we, you know, we we don't have like the economies of scale to to di dictate terms, and so that in itself, you know, is a challenge in terms of uh, the you know the capacity of African states to write rules that uh, work in their favor. They would uh, depend 
uh, on subtle lobbying and the benevolence of, uh, of, of China, which takes us to the next question, Barbara's question of whether, you know, China is colonizing Zimbabwe, colonizing Africa. And in, in my approach, in my studies, I, I've, I've sort of like, you know, been clear that um, I don't see any evidence of China colonizing Zimbabwe, I mean, Zimbabwe, I mean, colonizing Africa or any of the, you know, countries in the global south because the colon, colonization means something else and China is not doing that. So um, scholars, you know, you know, that study China, you have to come up with a, you know, a new framework to explain what China is doing. And the Western centric scholarship, you know, and also which is actually fed from, uh, you know, um, liberal leaning, you know, you know, um, popular press, you know, in the West, you know, that look here, China is doing this, you know, you know, Africans should be saved, you know, the Pacific should be saved. Look at what's happening in the South Pacific now. So that narrative, in my view, doesn't explain or capture the phenomenon um, as uh, as it is. You know, we need to find something else. What's clear is that uh, China's influence is um, is is expanding. Um, but what's also clear is that uh, they are not interested in running the countries. Uh, they are not interested in uh, uh, who runs the countries. They only facilitate the game, uh, the players you can bring. Because as I said, whoever comes into, into, into office, you know, will be able to deal with the, with the, with the Chinese. Um, you, you, you can't avoid them. That's why even America can't avoid them. That's why you, you saw even this conflict in Ukraine, even without saying anything, uh, you know, you know the, the West was saying China should say something. They were quiet. They said, no, you should say something. Said, no, I don't want to say anything. They said, no, say something. So, you know, China can't be ignored in that uh, particular regard. Um, so, um, and then, uh, uh, Tawana, you, you raise a uh, you know, very, very interesting, uh, you know, points. Um, and some of them, I think uh, they are more what I said when I was framing the talk. The difference between endogenous and exogenous factors. So, for example, the the ethnicization of politics and the weaponization of ethnicity in Zimbabwe. I see it. Uh, you know, there's a. You know, it could be a big talk on its own. You know, it's a, it's a, it's one of the issues endogenous to Zimbabwean politics, which um, you know by its character may not necessarily, uh, you know, be you know attributed to the to to, to the to the China, you know, to the China factor as, as it were directly, probably indirectly, I may, I may not know. This also goes for what you say, the, the entumbane, um, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, um, disturbance or conflict um, uh, that uh, uh, here, you know, you had, uh, uh, you know, two armies uh, that, uh, you know, you know, were linked to the political fortunes of political parties and political actors. And what then happened, you know, can be explained in that particular uh, light and also bringing in the, the ethnic dimension. So all these are things that I can say, they are factors that are endogenous to Zimbabwean politics rather than exogenous, you know, uh, factors. And you also, you know, raise this idea of, um, uh, you know the Maoist principles. You know uh, we are talking about um, the Zandla, You know combatants. You know I I agree. The 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 Zandla, uh, combatants, real combatants. Actually, Zobo says uh, Edison Zobo says. You know these guys with thought that we had uh, twenty thousand. Uh, you know guerrillas. In the assembly points, we declared the fifty thousand. So they declared some chimbidos and uh, muchibas and and others. And now, you know, this is why why we also have this problem now of the war vests that are being, uh, uh, you know, vetted, you know, throughout. You know, they are continuously being vetted, and some of them 
ask yourself, okay, this war vet, how old were they when they went to war? Uh, it comes from the, you know, assembly points. So people were sent to assembly points carrying sticks, you know, as the guerrillas when they were actually, you know, you know, not not, not properly trained. And the real guerrillas, you know, were were then uh, deployed into those, you know, zones that you say when that became no-go areas. And Taona, this is very critical because ZANU, if, you know, this is very important, particularly for opposing party, you know, uh, you know, activists, ZANU managed to create no-go areas when they were not in government. And at the time when Lord Soames was the referee, and he had, uh, you know, the right to, um, you know, you know, you know, d- d- disqualify any any political party. Actually, Joshua Nkomo writes in his uh, in his autobiography that uh, the story of my life that he went to Lord Soames, but then it was too big to be disqualified at that time. It was too big to be disqualified at that time, and and now you know they are in government. You know they have this uh, you know politicized military. They have this big patron, um, you know, of China. You know, well, well, what do you think can actually you know um, uh, you know they they lost the election in two thousand eight, and after losing the election, they said, okay, yeah, we'll give you prime minister. The president is will continue to be Robert Mugabe. So you you can see they they, they have the power dynamics there in terms of you know Zan and linked to that, you say. You know the gun. You know when did the gun start to lead politics? And I think I I didn't say in two thousand eight. In fact, I I went back to explain the the conceptualization of the high command uh, in the in the in the seventies as the starting point of this. And if you if 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 we were to maybe put a particular time, you remember the Nariba the re- rebellion. Um, so these guys went, you know, they were dis- they went into a disciplinary committee that was led by, uh, you know, the Dari Rishimura and the people like Ebed Shitep. But, you know, scholars have written that after those people had been said they are going to be reoriented and demoted, it was the high command that rounded up these people and executed them. They killed them. So... They, they even they, they, they even went and in fact the the Dari members actually uh, you remember the Matawere incident they were even uh, uh, you know afraid because the you know uh, people were saying you, you, you know you, you the Dari members were also complicit they were developing you know soft spot for the you know for the for the mutineers so it started long ago and your last question on North Korea. I'm 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 not sure how you know, uh, you know they managed to, to get hold of North Korea. But what's clear is that China and North Korea are in the same WhatsApp group. So the the you know you know you know you know that China it does not do alliances. You know there's no treaties, but they have only one country where they have been a treaty of defense or friendship, and that uh, country is North Korea. So. You could explain that uh, you know it was easy for you know ZANU or the ZANU government, which already had links to China, to establish a relationship with uh, with North Korea from that particular angle. And the last question uh, that uh, you raised, Mzala, about the opposition in Zimbabwe, whether it has made efforts to reach out. I, I, let me start by saying, in my conclusion, I said. Being anti-China is the language of opposition. It's a mobilizing force. If you become pro-China, you know, well, why why do we need you when when we have ZANU? So if you come with, you know, you, you are doing doing ZANU things. Zimbabwean politics has op- always operated on a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, it's either you are this or that. That's what, you know, that's what divides open politics. You say, no, 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 me, I'm in between. People don't like you. They want... You, you are for China, you are Zan. You are against China, you are something else. So that constituency is very important. So opposing parties have tapped into that. But you know, it, it is only useful to, for mobilizing, you know, votes, but not uh, 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 in, you know, adequate 
to gain power because, uh, like I said, the military, the veto actors working with the PLA, and we've seen that through the coup, how linked they are, when and the military business, you know, uh, complex that that surrounds that. You know what's happening in Marange. Uh, you know, you know, you know the you know the Chinese companies working with purportedly some. France of the um, you know special purpose vehicle of the of the of the military, so you you can see that. But in my research, so it's during the inclusive government, the the MDC in government, they were quickly uh, uh, oriented in in the in the ruling ideas of the time. So the. In fact, the, uh, um, as early as 2011, MDC ministers were already now signing, um, you, know, you know, cooperation agreements on behalf of uh, of, 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 of of the government, uh, uh, you know, with uh, with China. So they they were actually now sort of like part of 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 of, um, of that orientation uh, as it were. So. They, they, there was no resistance, you know. You can see even, you know, the Minister of Finance, you know, part of the strategy was engaging, you know, the 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 Chinese in terms of, um, you know, you know, your lines of credit, because China is the language of government in Africa. You you can't uh, you 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 can't uh, avoid them. So, uh, so for example, MDC ministers, you know, signed cooperation agreement with China during the uh, Vice Prime Minister. Vice Premier, rather, Mr. Wang Kishang's visit to Zimbabwe. And then also in 2012, Morgan Fangrai, you remember, uh, you know, he, he, he was invited to China and fitted by Chinese officials. And the highlight being uh, his one on one meeting with the Premier Wen Xiaobao. So you can see that the RODM DC acquiescence shows that uh, it was adapting itself to this uh, established uh, uh, political uh, reality. And some of my, you know, people. Some when I talk to people who were in that meeting, um, you know, between uh, Premier Wen Jiabao and Fangrai, they say that Fangrai actually failed the test. And I asked them why. They say, you know, Wen Jiabao asked Fangrai uh, reportedly so that uh, no, you see, uh, we, we, there's this issue that we have some of the. Loans, you know, that uh, we have extended to Zimbabwe are long overdue, and we, you know, well, what are you going to do about it? Supposedly, it was a, you know, a penalty for Tsangrai, and Tsangrai seemed to have thrown it over the bar because, reportedly, Tsangrai is said to have said, um, "No, you see, you know, we 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 know about these loans, and we are, we are committed to actually paying them off," and. It seemed maybe the Chinese didn't want to hear that because the Chinese wanted to see whether, you know, they would want to work with them. Because, you know, the big brother patron, you know, we, we see these who are going to come and talk to you. You know, you are, you know, you are always there to help us. So that element of, you know, subordinating themselves, you know, was maybe was, you know, what the opposition then was supposed to do. So in my view, Opposition politics and China may work, mobilizing force. But the reality is that uh, you, you see now, um, you know, in Zambia, uh, HH government, uh, you know, uh, you know, they are trying to bring in the Chinese into this date, um, you know, restructuring. You can't ignore them. Uh, um, you can't. Thank you so much. Um, Uh, th th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ngube. I will now open the floor to everyone who wants to give their input, who wants to ask a question or to comment. Please just send a speaker request. We'll give you a, a moment to speak. Uh, just send a speaker request, and then we are going to give you a moment to speak. Um, whilst you are waiting for, for the request, uh, I want to go back to to uh, Tiboza. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can clarify from your research uh, the, the 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 areas that you feel are uh, deserve investment. 
that China seems to be ignoring? And what could be the reason for that? Why is China preferring uh, to take care of construction projects um, and mining projects, but issues of tourism and other areas, they don't seem to have an interest in that. Why is that so? Uh, thanks, Mzala. I think um, one of the weaknesses that we, we have when we are analyzing China or we're forming opinions about China is the very basis of our uh, soft intelligence about it is based on what we are fed by uh, the liberal media, as, as uh, oh, oh, Dr. Nube has, has, has already said. Um, we have to understand uh, China as a deliberate and uh, structured operator. So they know what they want to do, and what they want to do is not uh, defined in terms of uh, short term. So this uh, political ideology of uh, winning the masses, uh, you know, with the guerrillas being the fish in the sea, has not only stopped it, it, within the borders of, of China, it, it is something that they export uh, in their engagements with um, external forces. Big construction projects are visible projects um, and they win the hearts and minds, uh, not only of the political class, uh, but you know, if well structured also of, of the peasantry within these uh, countries that are cooperating with, with, with China. So the big construction projects are an easy win for, for, for China uh, and they are quite adept at uh, doing these at, at pace. Um, so I don't think they are just limited to that, but I think it's an overall strategy for them. Um, the weakness that we have is that um, the collective of African countries don't actually have a joint strategy of uh, how they can engage with the Chinese uh, economic uh, muscle. Uh, we know that there is these uh, conferences that China has with, with Africa, and we don't know whether there is a, a coherent, um, uh, you know, grouped uh, intention that is written down. And even if it is, you know, we, we're still far away from that kind of uh, federation or cooperation to have a single policy on how we actually uh, engage with, uh, with, uh, with China. So I don't know, I can't really answer that. Um, you know, my guess would be it is probably um, a lack of uh, not political strategy, but maybe economic strategy. Um, because uh, as I said, when you look at the top 10 um, receivers of uh, foreign direct investment from China, for Zimbabwe to actually feature on number seven or eight, um, you know, we are actually punching above our weight when you consider that there's uh, 55 or 54 uh, sovereign countries uh, in, in Africa. So uh, I think if we're being open minded, um, we can't really box ourselves into just painting, um, you know, Chinese uh, financial investment with one brush. Um, I think uh, Chinese financial investment should be considered as a part of a basket of potential um, tools that Africa can use to uh, develop itself. And for me, I think the painful thing is that we, the countries that have got all this high level engagement with uh, China have not pushed for the kind of investment that would actually make a difference in terms of creating uh, employment. And those kinds of investments would be investments in you know, value addition in manufacturing, in uh, tourism, in, in financial services. You know, uh, we know that uh, China has got a lot of uh, foreign currency reserves. Uh, you know, if they are doing so much business in Africa, what stops them from actually uh, establishing, you know, financial services and um, externalizing some of that financial cloud and housing it uh, in Africa uh, so that Africa can, can, can benefit from that? So the, the construction projects are deliberate, uh, but they they are deliberate in that they, they serve a political purpose in terms of uh, visibility. Um, and, and we know that China is adept at changing how they, um, you know, uh, interact with uh, other nations 
depending on what the, the political climate or the economic picture is. A particular example is um, uh, some of the statements that um, the former uh, Greek uh, finance minister, who was finance minister under Alexis uh, Tsipras, uh, during the time when Greece was in financial uh, uh, trouble uh, and was threatening to exit uh, the European Union, uh, when he, when he, when Alexis Tsipras uh, got in, Yanis Varoufakis became the finance minister. Um, he has made statements, um, you know, as 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 um, uh, far as uh, around April of 2021, where he was giving a talk and he was saying that uh, Chinese investment uh, is is actually a humane investment and it's non-interventionalist. So um, he described a, um, uh, a situation where. He was interrogating a deal that had been signed by the previous uh, Greek government uh, with regards to operationalization of a, a port uh, in, in Greece. Uh, when he looked at the deal, he thought that the Chinese were paying less uh, you know, than they should have been in terms of the, the market value of uh, what they were going to get from uh, owning and operating that port. And he said that when he took them uh, and he sat down with them, he managed to renegotiate the deal without any sort of like uh, problems with that. And he was comparing and contrasting this with what would have happened if the, the people that had actually got the deal were a European country, for instance, uh, Germany. So I think we, we have to be open-minded about, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese factor uh, in terms of both the, the positives and, and, and the negatives. Uh, but I, I think in whatever it is that they do, there's nothing that, that is random in, in the investments that they, they choose to, to invest in uh, and also the people that they choose to, to, to make uh, uh, or to do business with. I don't know if I'm answering you, but I feel like I am. Yeah, yes, I think you have. Um, I th thank you so much. I've actually converted you to a co-host so that you can assist me to see if there are any people who have sent requests to speak. Because I've just lost a uh, Uno Santa. Uh, whilst we are sorting that out, I'll move to Taona. Taona, there have been complaints and a lot of noise about how the Chinese are desecrating land in Zimbabwe, taking over places, setting up mines, uh, and all that. What really is going on? And what's your reaction to that? I, I, I think it's. Um... Of course, uh, Dr. Ngube dismissed this uh, aspect of uh, colonialism, but I think there is a neo-colonial and neo-imperial template in terms of how China is politically, uh, culturally, and economically engaging uh, with Zimbabwe, because we are seeing, you know, Chinese, you know, companies, Chinese nationals, isn't it? invading and desecrating you know our ancestral lands our ancestral you know sacred shrines we have a good case in point of the uh the people of wange uh we have the good case in point of the uh, people of uh, what do you call it uh, of uja in, in, in murewa isn't it and we have also you know the high profile case of of, of um, um of, of Marange. For instance, we have seen so many you know, videos you know, on WhatsApp, on social media, of how the Chinese are extracting, they are not doing a, what, what do you call it, um, environmental impact assessment. You know, they are just coming in and bulldozing in and encroaching into you know, uh, our ancestral lands, into, into our indigenous land. For example, in Murewa, they are just in Mutoko. They're just extracting, you know, granites in it and exporting it in its raw form to 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 China. And we have seen footages whereby the dynamites were blowing the mountains in Murewa, and the villagers are running scared. Like there was no notice, there was nothing like that. And we've seen it, you know, graves, you know, sacred graves and so forth being also violated. And some people put a good a good case in point to say. Would a Zimbabwean ne person ever go to China or Beijing or whatever or one province and go and violate and desecrate 
you know, the graves or the tombs of the Buddhas, isn't it? That will never happen. And the other uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, part of it is that uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the roads which leads to where the granites are being extracted out of in Morewa, you know, they are, you know, the roads are in bad shape. In, and there is no, you know, sort of a, uh, social responsibility from the Chinese in terms of taking care of the environment, in terms of plowing back into the community, in terms of, you know, uh, putting, you know, the community, you know, at first, you know, um, at the forefront for everything they are doing. Because um, this is what I'm saying, it's a new imperial, new, new colonial agenda, because you look at how the Chinese conduct businesses, even the Chinese uh, construction company, extraction company, if they go to America, if they go to Europe and everything, how they conduct business in that uh in, 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 in that environment, in that in, in those countries, as compared to how they conduct businesses in, in Zimbabwe. Um, uh, uh, Taona, do then, we blame the Chinese or should we blame the government of the day uh, for allowing them to do that? I think the, the, the government of the day, the government of today, is um is the biggest culprit. You know what, Mzala? The government of the day, they always, you know. When they go to Sadak, when they go to uh, United Nations, when they go to African Union, they always be, you know, talking on top of their of their voices that Zimbabwe will never be a colony again, that Zimbabwe is a sovereign country, but and we don't like we don't want puppets from the West to rule over Zimbabwe. But if you look the Zimbabwean government, especially post two thousand and seventeen, the government of Emerson Mnangagwa, that you know, it's a clearly you know, of you know, a, a, a puppet of Chinese. Chinese are acting like the new slaveholder, the new colonial masters in, in, in Zimbabwe. We have seen incidents, cases where you know, uh, what do you call it? Even physical and verbal violence being perpetrated against ordinary Zimbabweans. Uh, Temba Mliswa raised the issue of, I think, um, uh, this um, tower manufacturing company in Norton, which you know. Its labor practices are akin to the same colonial labor practices which were used by the colonialists. But the government of Zimbabwe allows the Chinese to literally get away with murder. They don't enforce labor laws. You know, they don't enforce regulation. They don't, you know, enforce fines on Chinese. They don't reprimand Chinese. What instead do they do? They just give, you know, a slap on the wrist on, Chi on Chinese or they just turn blind eye on, on, on the Chinese. Because I, my my reasoning is that because I think because Chinese have underwrote um, you know the 2017 coup. I think the Chinese as well they they provided the insurance policy for the 2017 coup. And also another factor as well is what Dr. Ngube has uh, highlighted is that the that 2008 uh, UN Security, Security Council resolution, which China the unprecedented one, which was uh, ever awarded to an African country. By China is also has a largely, you know, uh, uh, effect on that. And, and, and it's like what Dr. Mube said that it's unfortunately that in in our in our opposition we don't have someone like Michael Sata who who had, who was a, who was a loose cannon who would tell it like like what it is who would be telling like in their face that Chinese your colonial masters to hell with you we don't want you in your country so we don't have like a, a political figure in that shape in the opposition. Who oh, yes, what they call maybe the balls to speak like that. Uh, th thank you so much for your insights, uh, Taona. Let's hear Tandazani. Tandazani, Moyo, you can come through, sir. Uh, thank you so much, host, and uh, greetings everyone in the platform. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, I think I've got a, a different view when it comes to the to the Chinese, I just feel like um, the way we are now accepting them in Africa, it's um, it's very unfortunate. But nevertheless, I will start by saying um, Chinese people are not good investors. But at the moment, Africa does not have option than to have these Chinese people uh, investing in Africa. The only thing that we need to do is to make sure that those people, they respect human rights, 
they meet the minimum wages of our people. And of course, I've always been emphasizing that um, these policies of re-engagement and, uh, and direct investors, to me, they don't work. We need to begin to promote our homegrown organic small businesses beginning to rise so that we can have our own people investing in Africa. Right now, if Chinese, if, if the people of China uh, decides to go back with their money, we are going back to the, to the same square again. Ah, it seems we have lost a uh, Tandazani there. Uh, Dr. Ngube, you have heard the various insights that people have, have uh, raised. There are any reactions to that? <clears throat> Thank you, Mzale. Um, yeah, I think let me let me uh, just hazard a few uh, reactions. You asked a question uh, to uh, to Boz about uh, you know why they're investing in construction and not in other you know sectors, and uh, um, then uh, uh, Tawana, then you know, which is good. Challenges that I'm saying. What China is doing is not colonialism. Is you know, we need a better concept to explain that phenomenon. Uh, so I, I want to, and also this idea of uh, you know Chinese companies, um, Chinese uh, what I call corporate China. Although when I frame the talk, I said my focus today because this these are you know uh, big big issues. So. Um, so you have uh, um, corporate China, you have the Chinese nationals, but I'll, I'll touch on that. So let's start with construction. The Chinese, you know, why are they, you know, investing in infrastructure? It's because infrastructure is the driver of economies. There is a clear and a present need for infrastructure in Africa. Um, in Zimbabwe, in the, you know, I also research in the South Pacific, you know, uh, in the Caribbean. So you find that the roads, you know, rail, uh, if you see the standard gauge rail in, in, in Kenya now, you know, Nairobi, Mombasa, those are critical, you know, um, you know, infrastructure that drive, you know, you know, the economy, uh, you know, the dam now, you know, in Zimbabwe, the Guayashangani dam. So, there is a clear need uh, for for these things. Is it uh, a, a, when we say is a clear, there is a clear need? Let's talk money. The in terms of money, Chinese money, in terms of loans, concessionary loans, are the most accessible, but also they are the most expensive. So you see the double-edged sword. So most accessible. And then the most expensive. And then you have the West, you know, that will, you know, the West, uh, you know, is interesting. They will say, you see, look here, don't work with the Chinese, but they, they won't do anything. You know, they plundered Africa and, you know, the rest of the global South, left them, you know, for, left us for dead. And uh, all that they could do is just to, just to, you know, help us uh, complain. But I, I, I subscribe to the notion of the, agency of African states as they engage with these actors, be it actors from the East, uh, like China, uh, you know, or actors from the West, uh, you know, so the, 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 the agency of our, uh, you know, you know, government is the one that is put to question. But for you to understand this, you have to also put it in the broader context. China, uh, doesn't that doesn't think small countries? Uh, uh, small countries are components, but they have this strategy of what I call bilateralism in their way. So, you have the African Union, and the Chinese have established their own FOCAC. So, FOCAC, the Forum, the Forum for China Africa Cooperation, is like your, you know, you know, you know, their version of um, of the AU. So, when China is engaging Africa. It engages Africa through FOCAC. So it has a bilateral relationship with Africa. So it comes, holds this partnership, China on one side and Africa, meaning these constituent countries, but seen as one. So the forum on uh, China-Africa cooperation. 
But also when China is giving out, dispensing those laws, those partnerships, we're talking about Zimbabwe in politics here, they also apply bilateralism. So Lesotho negotiates, you know, with China on its own. Burundi negotiates. So you know, when you know, when when President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta comes out of a meeting, he meets Idim Nangago. They don't talk about what the Chinese say because ED is also wanting to go and uh, and 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 talk about Zimbabwe. Uh, Uhuru wants to talk about Kenya, but the the Chinese, you know, you know, they like I say, they mark the game. They when they want to talk to Africa, they just call an assembly. They you know, an, a focus assembly. They talk they talk to Africans at once. When they want to talk to different countries, they will talk to the countries individually. So this is not just in Africa. You see what they've done with CELAC um, in the Caribbean and in Latin America. This is also just just uh, last week. The foreign minister, you know, when he was in uh, was in was in the South Pacific, where he was convening this uh, meeting of foreign ministers across, um, you know, the in, in the Pacific. So they took this big big blocks. So that that's the that's the reality of uh, you know you know you know you know China. Um, and then the, the, the second part of uh, the, what Taona was mentioning, which is right about, you know, involvement of uh, uh, what you say, China, you know, in, uh, you know, land desecration, you know, in these projects. And this is where we need to be very clear. So, like I said, when I framed the study, there, there is no monolithic China. There's nothing called China. That's like, you know, when I'm doing my things, bad things, people might say Zimbabweans do this kind of thing. But um, I'm currently working on a research, uh, you know, on chi- on corporate China in the ACP. And one of the things that I'm that I'm looking at is uh, the way in which corporate China operates, you know, or rather oscillates between two worlds. So, for example, these big construction companies, they would have come to you know these uh, uh, you know uh, jurisdictions on the coattails of the Chinese government to set up uh, to, to 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 set up or to execute infrastructural projects, uh, and they get you know preferential market entry, and then later on they then establish themselves independent of the Chinese government. Uh, then they they start to operate you know they, to get tenders, so. Uh, this notion of what I call comrade businessmen. So they are comrade businessmen because on one hand, they are linked to politics because of the relationship between these countries, because they, they were they were the executing agency of this relationship, but they've transitioned, they've domesticated and operationalized themselves um, as, an, as an independent entity. So a multinational company concept doesn't capture uh, the typical Chinese corporation. So they probably, this notion of a comrade businessman, you know, oscillating in both worlds. Just like I'm saying, you know, colonialism, uh, you know, as, as a construct uh, doesn't capture, you know, um, uh, what is happening. Uh, so the, there's nuance. The, we, 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 we need to go beyond, you know, the characterizations or the frames that are there to explain this phenomenon. Why? Because even, you know, the, the, the West itself does not understand what China is doing. When China started this going out strategy, it looked like, you know, they are playing. And now look at companies like Huawei, you know, they are like massive companies. When China started working with these small countries, the US was looking, you know, the other way. But uh, now, you know, the US, in you know, Australia, New Zealand, are running helter scatter in the in the, in the Pacific, so there is something about what China is doing, uh, uh, you know, that requires um, you know a different set of uh, of concepts to explain uh, what is happening beyond the Western conceptions of you know imperialism and colonialism, and and to, and, and for me, colonialism, you know, is you know the the, the best definition is what we experienced, you know, as, as Africa. This uh, goes, you know, you know, in a in a different direction. And and um, uh, I I saw, you know, there there are some, you know, you know, China Africa scholars here, you know, maybe probably they might uh, you know work to develop these kinds of you know 
new understandings of what is really happening. Yeah, I, I'll stop here for now. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nube, for that. Yeah, I saw Dr. Hozi earlier on. Uh, he was supposed to speak. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, Opet, if you're around, please send a request so that we give you an opportunity to, to express yourself as well. Uh, Tiboza, do you have any more requests? Yeah, I've just accepted uh, Wellington uh, as, a, as a speaker, um, and uh, we'll, we'll wait for him to come on board. I just wanted to ask uh, w one question to uh, Innocent Wireless. Uh, Wellington is, is, is getting ready. He's got his hand up already. Uh, well, to, to, to Innocent and also to anyone else uh, that is listening in and, and uh, what they would want to, to, to contribute to that. So when we look at um, uh, critical uh, resources uh, that uh, Africa has, um, we, we've got 90% of the, the world uh, reserves of uh, cobalt. We've got 90% of the world reserves of platinum. We've got 50% of the gold, 98% of the chromium, 70% uh, of the tantalite, 64% of manganese, and about 30 something percent of uh, the uranium. So if we are accepting that China has been growing uh, as a superpower and it will soon be overtaking the USA, and we accept that um, in as much as it is a big country with a big population, uh, they unfortunately are resource poor in terms of these uh, raw materials that they, 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 they need to uh, you know, uh, uh, lace their development. So it would be naive of us to look at China and say what China is doing when we've got all these riches. But I, I suppose the, 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 the real question for the political players within Africa is how do they structure that for, for mutual uh, benefit? So there's this Harvard scholar uh, that did some research. His name is uh, Kalestos. Juma, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name very well. Uh, he did some uh, research on uh, on Africa uh, and the, the the problems that are bedeviling Africa. One of the things that we have in Africa is that uh, you know in as big as a continent that we are, with so much fertile land, we are not uh, food self sufficient. And the reason why we're not food self sufficient is that we have positioned ourselves as importers of. Uh, finished goods, and that includes food as well. Um, and it would only take between five and 10 years with deliberate uh, strategies for uh, Africa to actually be uh, food self-sufficient. So in as much as we cry about some of the practices from uh, you know, the different facets of China that uh, Dr. Nguyen has, has explained, uh, I think a lot of uh, um, you know, the things that are happening are, you know, uh, just down to our own decisions in how we interact with all these, these other players. I don't think that there's a world that we can create where we can say we're going to ignore, ignore China because that's impossible. Even the USA themselves can't ignore them. Uh, anyway, I'll let uh, Wellington come in. Thank you very much, T. Boza, and thank you, Mzala Tom, for the space. And thank you for, for this great I like this question very much. Um, and my question to you, uh, Dr. Eno, uh, if you could comment and try- Wellington, are you eating? Oh, <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> well, now we are confused. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, uh, help me, Dr. Eno, at least, you know, to put it in, I'd like to follow clean arguments, these academic arguments. Sadly, sometimes, uh, you know, politics is not mathematics. I'm better off in mathematics sometimes. But uh, I'll premise my question to you so that you can understand the context. Um, China has become so huge and so relevant that even countries like the UK here, they ask for Chinese investments, where it prefers them, uh, uh, you know, to 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 use their or sell debt so that China buys some of their debt 
or they may do, uh, they will engage China for the better or greater good of the economy of the UK. And yes, obviously, they will come in and roll back on security concerns like Huawei and try and limit that. And then uh, I was in a space, uh, a CCC supporting space, and I asked this question that will your leader not set up an office to really talk to China as government in waiting and have conversations with China, particularly in terms of the future of Zimbabwe? Because if countries like the UK see and accept the powerfulness of, of, of the Chinese uh, uh, reserves in money, foreign money at that, surely even Zimbabwe should, they, with everything that is wrong with Chinese contracts in Zimbabwe, I, surely China has a place to play as an investor in some shape or form. Should I, if I took over Zimbabwe, I would definitely be sending off a trade mission to China. As much as I would send, I would probably send a bigger one to China before I send an equally big one to the United States. And, uh, you know, the whole thing was completely stripped down. And I was like, am I, am, am I blind? You know, so if that could be crystallized, and yes, I can see the way Zanu has built up a relationship with China, they are not leveraging smart contracts at all, or maybe because China will, will, will give a nod and give the army something. I don't know. I'll, let me not speculate. But if you can help me understand so that at least us Zimbabweans, we should know the reality of, of, of the global economic sphere and to come up with smart solutions. Thank you. I hope I hope you understand this so question, not so question statement. Thank you, Dr. Eno. But you're a, you are a, you are a researcher. You can you can sift through my submission. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, over to you, Doc. Um. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much. Um. So, the. I think maybe I'll, let me start with Tibosa. So the idea of um. Uh, you are saying that you know Africa has uh, critical resources. You know, um, I agree. Uh, but uh, you know, and then you know, Africa. You know, when I say Africa again, we also need to know that you are talking about fifty-four countries, right? And so that in itself is both a strength and a weakness. So, if you look at the the statistics of intra-Africa trade. Um, you 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 know you start to get the picture that uh, there is no Africa to 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 really uh, talk about. Uh, there is no consensus in terms of what we want amongst ourselves. You, you know, it's more difficult to travel within Africa. You know, you know, connecting flights than it is to travel from London, for example, to to Bujumbura. You know, you know, from uh, from Kigali to to Paris or something like that. So you know the. When you don't have leverage on, of resources, you know that's of the resources that we have, you know they just become, you know, you know something moot, as it were, you know. So, debatable in terms of the potential, and and how you know that potential can be, uh, can be realized. You will find that talking about cobalt, uh, you will find that uh, the cobalt, you know, the the. The companies, Western companies, you know, China, everyone is there, you know. And some scholars are even thinking that, you know, does the DRC state exist? You know, there is debate about whether the DRC, you know, actually exists or not, or it is uh, being uh, uh, cannibalized by, you know, you know, you know, all these actors. And I'm talking now when the king of Belgium is in the DRC, and you know, you know, you can see that. Uh, all these things, you know, about our our um, historical past always comes and catches with us, uh, catches, catches up with us, as it were. So, 
the critical resources that Africa has, um, we remain, you know, potential that is not realized until we 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 organize ourselves uh, properly, and uh, not at the AU, which is funded largely by uh, European money, because the budget of the of the African Union, you know, the operating cost, are funded is funded by you know Western players, the 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 place where they convene was constructed by China. So you can see that you know it's actually China versus you know the West, uh, and and uh, you know we we are just uh, we as Africa or as Africans we are we are just uh, you know part of that big uh, bigger uh, chess uh, game as it were. Um, China now is constructing um, a, a, is it a, 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 you know an infectious disease a, you know a center a CDC a Africa. You know, CDC um, in in um, in uh, in Addis Ababa, the one that was there, I think it was, you know, was constructed by you know, Western funding. So, you know, the, so you can see the competition between China and the West, and you know, African countries are you know on they are uh, watching by the sidelines, and so. Uh, when we when we when we when we talk about you know Zimbabwe you know, the issue of uh, what uh, Wellington asks about um, you know opposing politics engaging China I spoke about this in my in my talk I um, I, I mentioned that um, being anti-China is a legitimate uh, op opposition organizing you know you know strategy because it, it uh, you know in particularly in Zimbabwe, I hope that Nzala, Nzala sometimes will sometimes will you know bring us to talk about the Rhodesian Front. So how you, the Rhodesian Front actually you know produced ZANU. So ZANU PF has produced the kind of opposing uh, you know politics that is now here. So if ZANU says pro-China, it's, it's 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 logical for the opposing to say anti-China because you'll find a constituency there. If you say pro-China, you know, they'll say, ah, okay, so let us go with ZANU then. Uh, because ZANU is already has established these networks. But the 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 language of governance, you know, includes China. So just like I mentioned when Mzala asked, the MDC ministers were, were quick to you know, to, 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 to sign deals with, um, you know, the Chinese government. They went, you know, you remember that in that trip that was advertised in the Herald uh, where, you know, you know, Prime Minister Sangrai was invited there. Uh, they were fitted, they were given all these, you know, cell phones, Huawei cell phones and stuff like that. They came back happy because the Chinese can really make you happy. They, 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 are, they are good at making you happy. So the, the Chinese, whoever comes into power, in Zimbabwe, we'll have to work with China. We'll have to work with this military. Those are, you know, those are things that are, are quite are quite clear. So, however you want to make of it, you know, it is 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 the reality uh, uh, that is that is uh, that is out there. Um, given both the dynamics in the country that I mentioned in my talk, and also the broader global dynamics of this ascendancy unassailable ascendance of China across the global south, mobilizing, you know, countries in the, in the UN, you know, it, it, you know, it has got this mob, it, it, this effect, and um, now we have established their own platforms uh, that counteract the multilateral platforms, FOCAC, CELAC, and this, uh, you know, body, you know, you know, in the South Pacific. So you can see that um, um, the West, is cornered, but us as Africans, we need to think and talk amongst each other so that we leverage our collective might to confront both the West and China. Because if we don't do that, we'll remain, you know, a, a, a punching uh, a boys and watch, you know, the the big league, uh, you know, being played by the big guys. Wow, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Doc. Um, we're supposed to close this space at nine. 
Um, I'm seeing we are already 20 past nine. I've sent a request to Dr. Hozi. I don't know if he has seen it. I would have loved to hear his insights. He's also an expert uh, on Chinese international relations. It would have been good to hear him out. Um, I don't know if he has seen it. We're going to give him an opportunity uh, to, 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 to speak as well. Um, is he? Aha, he has joined us. Uh, Opet, good evening and welcome. Hi, hi, I'm Zalatom. How are you? Um, thank you. I'm fine. Th th thank you so much for, for joining us. <laughs> I know you have a lot to say about China. Um, well, a, a, lot, a lot has been said, and uh, thank you very much to Innocent for such a detailed um, uh, presentation. I think it was really, really good. Uh, just a few thoughts that I have. I think that, um, first of all, something that Innocent said that I would really want us to think about carefully is to think about when we say China is doing A, B, C, and D, who exactly are we talking about? So McKinsey did a research and found out that 90% of Chinese businesses in Africa are private enterprises. And these, uh, and these private enterprises, um, some of them, the Chinese embassy in the particular country where they're operating, do not have an idea that they're operating there. So that takes away this whole idea about talking about China as a unitary actor with a clear strategy, knowing exactly what is happening in Ozumba with the, with the granite um, quarries. So that's, that's an important thing for us to think about. It helps us then to start seeing and addressing what the main problems are. And I want to give an example of the granite mining in, in Zimbabwe, or even if you talk about diamond mining. We need to think about Zimbabwean actors that attract certain Chinese kind of business people and certain kind of Chinese investors. And that's where our attention should be in making, in putting our house in order so that we don't attract the bad kind of business people. And it's not just happening with the Chinese, it's happening with the Russians, it's happening with Albanians, it's happening with some American or some Austral Australian companies. Why do we keep getting all these bad companies? It is not because Australia wants to import these bad companies to us. It is because our political elites are actively looking for people or investors that are corrupt, that will float the rules, because they want to get illicit gain from those investments. So we should deal with our political elites and start thinking about who called Anjin to come and mine diamonds in Zimbabwe. How did it get into joint ventures with the Zimbabwean military and all the Zimbabwean actors who are involved? Who is protecting these Chinese businesses? And I think someone said something about uh, how the government protects this kind of Chinese people. So we should put our house in order. And unless we put our house in order, we will continue to have all bad business people with strange ideas and fair corrupt coming to Zimbabwe. And the Pomona scandal actually shows that we're attracting the bad kind of people. Uh, the second thing is that um, one of the things that is good about Chinese loans is that the Chinese do not come to you, to Zimbabwe, and say, we have this loan, do you want to get it? It is our political leaders who go to China and request particular loans for particular projects. And if they do not have an idea, or in some cases, I'll give an example of something that happened a couple of years back with NetOne. What happened with NetOne is, uh, the government guaranteed a loan that was given to NetOne, right? And NetOne executives bought equipment using Chinese loans. And then on the other hand, they formed their own company. And what they did then is, after about a year or so, they then said, this equipment that we bought from China 
is not working, is not suitable for us, then they sold, net one then sold that equipment to the company owned by the executives. And then the executives started offering services to net one using the same equipment that had been bought by China. Now, when it is being reported, it then comes out as, look at what these Chinese are doing, but this is what our political elites and this is what our environment allows these people to be able to do. That's a big challenge that we have. So our political system creates all this corruption that ends up coming back and hurting us, the ordinary people. But that's not to say that the Chinese government, the Chinese state is not really, doesn't really have a strategy or something that it wants to do with Zimbabwe. I think the thing that what happens is if we do not know, I think Innocent talked about that, if we do not have a clear plan of what kind of business do, what kind of businesses do we want the Chinese to invest in? What kind of infrastructure development projects do we want? What kind of uh, quality, how are we going to check the quality and all those things? We are going to continuously cry because we are not, we don't have the infrastructure there, but the institutional structures, the regulatory structures, the ability to implement the laws that we have. I watched one of the videos where uh, about them coming back to them, and I'm about to close now. I'm coming back to 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 the example of the granite mining. It happens where I come from. I come from Ozumba, and they have been mining that granite, not the Chinese. First it was the Danish, and then other people came, and now it is the Chinese. But uh, the environmental, um, uh, I can't remember what it is called, Emma. Environmental management, I, I can't remember it's, but Emma, right? Emma then says, we did the environmental assessment and everything is above board. And if you check the, um, um, if, if you follow China, the Chinese embassy in Zimbabwe's uh, uh, um, um, handle on, on Twitter, you will see how the Chinese have been posting a lot about how Chinese businesses in Zimbabwe are following Zimbabwean laws. They are by, by the, what the authorities in Zimbabwe say. So indirectly, what they're saying is by criticizing Chinese businesses, beating up workers, doing all these crazy things that we've been talking about, they are saying we are doing what the laws in Zimbabwe allow us to do. Now, the Chinese will not do the same thing in the UK. They will not do the same thing in Sweden. They will not do the same thing in Rwanda because in Rwanda, a Chinese manager who was beating up workers was sentenced to prison. So they will not do that because the laws in those countries do not allow them to do that. So I think what we are seeing with China in Zimbabwe, and, and, and finally, Zimbabwe is not that important to China at all. Right. If if you look at if you look at if if you look at how much um, China if if you rank regions global regions right uh, Europe Asia Africa and all that stuff the percentage of trade that Africa has with China is only four percent the whole of Africa. Someone gave statistics and said about seventy five billion of loans were given to African countries. That's 54 of us, 54 countries given 75 billion or 60 billion as it was announced a couple of years back. That is one deal that China made with Pakistan that shows us how small we are, that if we are wiped out today, China will continue, right? So we need then to start thinking about how do we make ourselves competitive no matter how small we are? How do we attract the right kind of businesses that save the interests that we have and what we want to achieve? Unless that is clear from our government, we will not get anything from China. We will not get anything from any other country. I'll just stop there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hozi, uh, for this great, great, it illuminating uh, insights. Uh, let me take Kurunda.
and then I uh, will then wrap it up afterwards. Kurunda? Yeah, Kurundai. Oh, sorry, Kurundai. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. thank you, Mzala. Thank you so much for the spaces. Uh, mine is not uh, a, a, a question to, 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 to doctor, you know, and also I'm not going to give my submissions uh, at a level of, you know, the academic. No, I'm just going to give my submissions uh, basing from the uh, real facts. I, man, I happen to have the privilege, the privilege to talk to uh, the ambassador of Zimbabwe to China. And also I happen to have the experience to see a Zimbabwe taking an investor, uh, a Zimbabwean living in China, taking an investor, a Chinese investor to Zimbabwe, who is, who is or who was interested in gemstones. So I want to give those, uh, or to, to I want to to to, to give those uh, examples uh, in 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 as in, 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 in a way of concurring what Dr. Ino uh, submitted. First, I, <clears throat> I I checked the facts how China investors perform in Africa. Then I realized that in in Zimbabwe, in Africa, sorry, Zimbabwe is the least probably a country with the Chinese investment. Check those facts. It, they, they will tell, they will lead us, they will lead you to, to, to that. Uh, uh, also, I happen to live in Mutare, in Mozambique, Mozambique along the border of Zimbabwe. The Chinese are mining gold, they're mining every precious mineral along the border of Zimbabwe from Penalonga uh, up until uh, 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 Kanyemba there. Chinese are along the border mining special minerals there. Then I asked the ambassador, why is it that we are a, we are an all-weather friend of China? Why is it that Chinese, they, they hesitate to come and invest in our country? Then the ambassador told me that, no, you know what? A, like exactly what uh, Dr. Ino said, Africa is uh, 54, Africa is 54 nations. And when Chinese come to Africa, they engage us and talk to us on a bigger platform. Then later on, they go to individual countries. So you realize if China wants to, you know, to exploit gold in Africa, they will go country by country. So we, our leaders, are very smart. Our policies are very, very clear, and they are pro people. So Chinese will at least go to a country where they gain more than to Zimbabwe, because our policies are pro people. So they will not come to us. So that's the reason why you see them going to Mozambique. Because in Mozambique, they benefit quite a lot. They will compare. Well, if you go to Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans, they, told, they, they are telling us that if you come here, you invest this, it means our people have to benefit in this way and this way and this way. So they will go to a country which offers, you know, a, a, a cheaper or a little, a little bit of relaxed conditions. So I, 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 I concur with Dr. Ino's uh, submissions. We are, not, we are not there to give away our resources. Chinese are not that much in Zimbabwe in comparison to other countries. There are a few. Why, they are, why are they a few? Because our policies are very clear. They are pro-people policies. They don't want to come to Zimbabwe in la their large numbers. We are talking of a nation with 1.4 billion people. We are talking of a nation with the most millionaire in, 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 in the world, millionaires in, in, in dollars, US dollars in the world. And then you, you tell me that Zimbabwe has, you know, is, is being invaded or is being threatened or is being recolonized by Chinese. No, check Mozambique, go to Angola, go to Namibia. If you check your facts, they will tell you that Namibia has the best roads in Africa. Who considered those roads? They are Chinese. On cash, no, because no, on, 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 on loan basis because of the mineral, they have minerals they have. Now, again, my second example. There is a citizen who lived in China for many years, had a friend, and the friend said, oh, I have money, a lot of money, he's a millionaire Chinese. The guy took the millionaire to Zimbabwe. I'm talking of recent information. He took the millionaire to Zimbabwe. The guy happened to be a member of AAG. He's currently, he's the current spokesperson of AAG. He took the guy to Philip Chiangwa. The Chinese guy took to Philip Chiangwa. The next thing was to go to the Minister of Mines. 
the minister of mines told him that we you want to invest in uh you want to exploit our gemstones right then yes then the minister man said well look here you cannot export gemstones as raw as they are to china you have to establish a, a value addition factory here in zimbabwe above all the community near or the community near the near the area you're going to exploit the resources has to benefit too. So come up with a plan that is going to benefit the local people. And the guy said, okay, I have an idea. I realized that the climate is like this and so forth. So I'm going to introduce a mushroom production in that area. So gentlemen, fellow Zimbabweans, let us, re, let us come to these spaces. Okay, with the real facts, with the reality, don't speak from, you know, from the, the, this doctor, the last speaker, doctor, you're in UK and you just, you know, check or probably you go to this library, you check research, researches of a fellow a doctor who is anti-Zimbabwe. The reality is Zimbabweans, are, the Zimbabwean government is pro-people. Chinese are not, are not in any way invading or, or, or exploiting Zimbabwean minerals for free. No ways. Thank you, Mzala. Okay, Th thank you, Kurundai. Uh, we have Mafupa. Mafupa will be our last speaker because we have to close now. Mafupa, just be brief. Thank you so very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to you, host and co-host. Uh, for me, uh, I hear what the other speaker said. But um, yes, the relationship between uh, Zimbabwe and China in terms of uh, bus business dealings is, uh, is questionable in a lot of ways. Yes, there are certain benefits that come with investors. But when you look at it from a serious point of view, you realize that when you actually do a proper job to check where they are investing, they are actually concentrated more in mining and uh, for a very good reason. I, I actually wonder what, what is there to invest in mining. In my view, mining, you are just coming with your, your wall and your peak and taking people's resources, local people's resources, and you take and uh, benefit. It's actually... It, it, for me, it's a lot of um, mining is not investment. Mining is looting. And uh, by and large in Africa, the regulations, in the way business is done, especially in the mining sector, leaves a lot to be desired because they, it's not transparent. And it's actually fueling a, a lot of the corruption that we are seeing. And uh, the Chinese are at the forefront of doing under, underhand dealings, which actually compromise the dignity and standing of our leaders. So at the end of the day, I, if we take the Chiazwa, Chiazwa, the diamonds, I, I'm not sure, I, I, I need to be informed a little bit, but I, I don't think there is transparent in the way those uh, diamonds are being mined, but I understand that it's being mined by the Chinese. So for me, the problem that I have with the Chinese is precisely on the basis that they do a lot of underhand dealings, which are by and large corrupt. So they know how to corrupt leadership and the leadership then ignore their own citizens. And in that process, this is the main reason why the locals, have, they, they are not and I'm, I would say, as Africans, I don't think it's wrong or it's bad. If we don't have enough resources among our own people to uh, get this uh, to mine, if our people are not skilled enough to mine, why let the resources stay in the, in the earth until such a time when we have our own people who can do it? Why should we now finish everything? For what do the next generation get? So for me, it's not about just mining for the sake of getting money. Yes, money we can get, but once our our client, the environment, if we mess up our own environment, our own nature, that we cannot replace. 
today and tomorrow you you can lose okay th th thank you so much uh, mafupa uh, i missed uh, lakson unlovu lovu please quickly come through as we wind up uh thank you thank you so much mzala i'll try and uh speak for less than two minutes let's hope my two minutes does not become dr divorce's two minutes but anyway um so i mean the, the main point of an investment is to is to retain what we call uh, in management accounting a positive net value uh, uh, or npv so what is this npv this is basically a calculation which factors in the amount put into the investment less the accumulated cost incurred during the investment period factoring uh, factored with the interest rate to sum up uh, to the sum which would, would have been invested uh, that calculation must retain a positive figure if it does not retain a positive figure then the investment must not be pursued so every business will strive for that be it the british the american the chinese but now to decorate the investment the business or the old be uh, investor would embark on what we call uh, a rehabilitation exercise. Uh, so basically, this is the after the end of the investment, uh, the, re the, re the, re the rehabilitation exercise is basically to uh, sort of a corporate social, social responsibility. Where in addition to the investment, the investor will embark on the uh, development exercise of the communal areas. Uh, but now to minimize the payback to the investment some investees who then say um now instead of me uh paying back let's say a thousand dollars every month for the next 10 years let me pay you back a thousand dollars for the next five years don't redevelop the areas don't do the rehabilitation exercise i will do the rehabilitation exercise myself this becomes a win-win to the investor and the investee but the problem at the detriment of the community and the villages around. So this is basically what we've seen, that our government is not willing to pay back the invested amount in full. So they will say, okay, it's fine. Do whatever you want, leave the area. We'll do the development ourselves. But then from the layman, when we're seeing it, we're thinking that, oh no, these Chinese, they've come here, or these investors, whoever it is, they've come in here, they've developed, but then they've developed in bad faith. But the actual truth of the matter is that those will be the terms of the uh, investment to say that uh, don't do the rehabilitation exercise. Uh, just do the investment. I'll do the development. I'll do the corporate social responsibility myself after the investment is complete. I just hope that was not too much of accounting joke on. Uh, let me just stop there. But I just wanted to share that light. So that we, while we're arguing, we must be conscious to that factor. So thank you so much, Mzal. Uh, thank you, Baba Nshofu. Uh, thank you, thank you so much to everyone who has uh, participated in this uh, space. Uh, we thank you especially Dr. Innocent uh, Mube, who was our main lecturer for the day. Thank our discussants, uh, Dr. Nkomo, Taona Denere, um, Babra, Gwangwara, Tanyanyiwa. Uh, we thank Dr. Hozi as well for assisting us with this uh, uh, discussion. The space is recorded, so we'll continue to engage uh, th th throughout uh, using the recording and the hashtag China Zimbabwe politics. Uh, Dr. Nube opened by honoring uh, um, the late uh, Alex Magaisa, who was very, very active uh, on Twitter spaces. Uh, I would like to give Taona just a minute to say some special remarks uh, about Alex Makaisa, and then we can close uh, our space. Tawana, I'll hand over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you. I think, um, you know, uh, Alex Makaisa, you know, was a larger than life personality. He was a distinguished in academic, and um, you can see, and it was, um, you know, uh, because through one, his uh, great works in academic field, as well through his genuine and humble connection with people. That's why you have seen outpouring, you know, contagious or infectious, genuinely heartfelt grief across the country. 
I think what Alex Magaisa typified what are called organic intellectuals, because Alex Magaisa was very gifted because he had the pulse, you know, he could able to, to hold the pulse of the nation in his hands in terms of you know, articulating and um, intellectualizing and also at the same time simplifying the uh, social, legal, political, economic or cultural problems in, in, in Zimbabwe. And uh, I myself, I can proudly say that um, I came out of uh, Alex Magaisa intellectual and academic uh, uh, conveyor belt. It was Magaisa actually reached out to me in 2019. And because I was always um, uh, a regular uh, commentator on his uh, Facebook postings, and he said, oh, you really come on my posting quite a lot. And I've seen that you put on very some well thought out, you know, points. But I believe that, you know, you are better than this. Why are you limiting yourself to just making short commentary and all that kind of stuff? And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, it was, uh, he said, you remind me, me, the younger version of myself. So uh, why can't you, you know, translate this short commentary into well thought out opinion pieces? And he said, I'm more than happy to guide you through, to hold your hand through. In other ways, I'm more than happy to babysit you through this whole process until we can able to walk on your own, on two feet. So that's how I started to write my own opinion pieces, you know, because and Alex told me that young man, you know, just take a leap of faith and jump in and you'll be, you'll be making it. And sooner or later, you'll start to realize Oh, these things of writing and the analyzing the social, economic, or political problems in our country just comes naturally. And he says to me, young man, the harvest is plenty, but the reapers are few. He said, there's so much to analyze and articulate and write about in, in, in Zimbabwe, you know, but there are few people who are stepping up on the board. So just come on the board and write to sooner or later, you start to realize we are, we are, we are, we are, we are a big figure. And I'll, I would say, you know, Zimbabwe, you know, is going to be poorer without Alex in terms of, you know, intellectual, academic, political, legal, you know, discussions and debates. And it's a tragic that we lost Alex at a very, very crucial moment whereby Zimbabwe is just hardly maybe less than nine months away from the national politics. And at, the, at this point in time where we have been expected Alex Magaisa is usually leading from the front, you know, opening up debates and exposing and challenging both the opposition and the and the ruling party. So I think the best way we can honor Alex Magaisa is for us to want, you know, to just be humble, respectful, and be just be genuine to each other and say. Uh, not let our egos. One thing I find out from Alex, despite his, you know, he was he had so much impressive academic and professional and professional credentials on his side, but he was never, you know, get addicted to what I would call a uh, the self-aggrandized narcissistic drug. It was not many people who became top, you know, level academics and professionals, just like Alex Magaisa, are so humble enough to interact and socialize and intellectualize with, with ordinary people. That was such a rare gift because you never even thought that this man is got such an impressive, you know, academic, uh, professional, you know, background. But it was very simple in his approach. I think, like I guess, I think that's the way we can just, you know, best honor uh, uh, Magaisa because I, uh, he just reached out to me from nowhere and said, young man, I, I can help you to, you know, to polish up your your political commentary and to be a better opinion writer and i was just a nobody i was just a nobody i just think i just had like 900 or 600 friends on my facebook you know i was just a nobody but alex introduced me to this world of ideas to this world of, you know of, of intellectual debates loads of, of opinion pieces writing and so forth i think it's a great loss it's a great loss because i would say he's an irreplaceable figure very irreplaceable, I think, and I'll say, may his soul rest in peace. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, 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 Taona, for this uh, moving uh, eulogy of uh, uh, Alex Makaisa. With those remarks, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Ngube, for preparing this lecture, teaching it eloquently and adequately. We look forward to more engagements uh, on this topic and other topics. Thanks to everyone for listening. The space is recorded. We'll continue to engage uh, on the timeline. Have a good evening. Thank you so much.